We're going to do a couple things this morning. The first, very importantly, uh, once again, I'd like to thank John, Martha, Brian, the entire King Schools team for hosting such a spectacular event. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Second thing we're going to do today is we're going to solve some problems, okay? How many flight school owners do we have out there, flight school managers that are involved in flight schools? We have no challenges, right? It's a perfect world. There's nothing that we need to deal with on a daily basis. Wrong statement. Every day we're dealing with challenges. So we're going to look at one thing that you can do today that can solve a number of challenges that we as flight school owners, operators, chief instructors, check instructors, line instructors have to make our flight school better and make some of these problems go away. As we've heard from previous presenters, there seems to be a little DPE shortage out there right now. This is one big thing that you can do at your school to make that challenge go away. And along the way, we're gonna deal with some other things. Getting better trained and standardized CFIs on board with our flight school. While that's happening, we're gonna draw better students to our flight school and do this all at a very low or, or no cost. Okay, so let's take a look at how we're gonna do this. You've all seen the, the uh, bios for uh, Mr. Crudden from our FISDO that's going to join us uh, here today uh, and, and myself, so you know a little bit about me. Uh, let me tell you about uh, our experience with, flight, uh, with examining authority that we're gonna talk about today. So we were first approved for examining authority in 2018. And it was a long process because nobody in our FISDO at that time had any experience with examining authority, and that's very common. According to um, Gene Hardy, who is the FAA's foremost authority on 141 issues, uh, by her count, there are 47 schools that have examining authority across the US. That's not even one per state. So it's not, and out of 77 FISDOs, it's not unusual to expect that your FISDO might not have a experience with examining authority. So it's, uh, you need to link arms with the FISDO moving forward to figure out how to do this and how to negotiate the sometimes confusing regulations that govern it. So we hold examining authority for seven of our 11 141 approved programs. It just so happens to turn out that these seven are the most frequent programs that are bread and butter programs. Private, we have it for both private single and private multi, the instrument rating for airplanes, initial commercial single, the add-on multi for commercial, then CFI and CFII as well. So since 2018, we've issued over 500 pilot certificates or ratings for uh, across the spectrum. And so far this year, we've issued 150, 150 certificates. And there's uh, 16 certificates that we've had done uh, that are outside of these programs that we've had done by DPEs. So in 2020, uh, I was appointed by the FISDO as an Airman Certification Representative, and we'll talk about what that means uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So that's a little bit about me and our school. Let's see if we can find out a little bit about you so that we can tailor some of these answers to, to your needs specifically. Uh, may need, uh, may require for you to step up if you've got your cell phone with you, please pull out your cell phone. And the easiest way is to come up a little bit closer and with a QR reader, go ahead and snap that QR code. I tried it earlier in back from about Brian, 
Brian and back, it uh, was a little far for uh, QR codes to uh, capture in your cell phone. That is the easiest way. There's three ways to make this work. One is to snap the QR code. That's the easiest. The second way is to go and onto this site right there, uh, pull EV, and uh, and then slam Bob Hep 915. That will take you to the same site that the QR code goes to. That will give you these these tables right there on your uh, on your phone. It looks like some people started to figure this out already. We must have a couple of people under 30 in here, right? The, uh, if you can't get that to work, then you can go into your text function and uh, to that number right there, go ahead and text Bob Hep 915 Now on that one, you're going to need to, as the different questions come up, go ahead and put in the A, B, C, D, E type responses. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody getting logged in? So I'll give it just a second and allow some of the responses to come in. Looks like we got a lot of 141 schools out there. That's a great thing. See, Ronnie, I told you this would work. <laughs> And it looks like some folks are here for the food, too. <laughs> okay, so it looks like the predominance of folks uh, out here are 141 schools uh, that are not provisional. Uh, then we've got some 61 schools. Looks like we have a school out there that has examining authority already, so you can uh, back us up on what we're gonna give to you today and then some here just for the snacks. All right, so the next question. Okay, what is your position in the flight school? Oh, a lot of flight school owners. All right, looks like we have a lot of flight school owners, some chief instructors out there, that's great. M management, okay, exactly the audience we're looking for. Okay, so let's talk about some of uh, what is examining authority first, since there's a lot of folks out there that don't know exactly what examining authority is. I'll let you go ahead and read it. This is what the FAA's definition in part 141, what they say examining authority is and what it does. A few significant things here. One is it says that you can get examining authority for flight and for knowledge tests, okay? Most commonly done is flight. I don't believe that there's very many schools that uh, get examining authority for knowledge tests, although it's possible. The administrative overhead of doing that is pretty extensive, and it really doesn't do a whole lot for your school. So. Most schools continue to send their students to now PSI facilities that uh, are around the country in decreasing numbers, unfortunately. So it says that somebody who graduates from an approved course that uh, at a school that has examining authority for that course may be issued a pilot certificate by graduating from that course without the need for a test by a DPE, okay? This is how we help solve the, the DPE crisis that we have. 
So what's different about it is that in the regulations, the uh, final stage check, instead of a check ride, the final stage check is considered part of training. It's not part of, it's not a test, and that test is now no longer required if your school has examining authority for that program. So when they complete that training, then they can be awarded a pilot certificate if they have examining authority for that. The difference is, is that they can't fail training. They can go back for more training, additional training, and then come back for, to have that item looked at again on a final stage check, but there is no formal failure to a graduate of a uh, program with examining authority. All right, a couple more questions for you. How far in advance do the DPEs, do you need to schedule a check ride with a DPE in your area? Nobody 14 days or less, huh? Okay, so it looks like the most popular, about 50% of the, the uh, folks out there, 28 to 42 days, okay? More than four weeks ahead, do you uh, need to schedule with a DPE? And unfortunately, some DPEs won't allow you to schedule until that person is fully complete with all of the aeronautical experience requirements and have been signed off. So for four weeks or greater, that student needs to pay to keep their, their uh, currency and check ride ready so that uh, when they go to the examiner, they can uh, be ready for that check ride. That's a big, big problem for the schools and for the students. How much do your people pay for a check ride? This is for a typical private pilot check ride, understanding that as they go up, uh, that the, the amount that the DPEs charge goes up with it. Wow, more than $800 for a private pilot check ride sure filled in quick. 950, 950, wow. How much? 950. Whoo! Unreal. Okay, so the the most expensive bands are the ones that filled in there. So from 700 to 950 is what most people are paying for a private pilot check ride. Wow, if times changed. Okay, so how far do your students travel to get to a check ride? If you've got a DPE at, uh, either on staff or at your home airport, not a big problem. How far do they go? Oh, good. A lot of them, uh, or if the DPEs are willing to travel to your location if they're covering a certain area. Or now with the geographical boundaries removed, the DPEs can fly right in, or, or more incentivized to come right to you. Okay, so it looks like it's uh, the top band and the bottom band. Most folks, fortunately, can take their check ride right on their home turf, but a lot of, the, the next most popular one is that they go 30 nautical miles or more away. Okay, that puts them to a disadvantage when they go take their check ride because they're out of their home element. Okay, so let's take a look at this. If your school has examining authority, here are the advantages to your student. One, they, it's a, a shorter schedule time. The scheduled time to take their final stage check is just how long it takes to get on the calendar with your chief instructor, assistant chief instructor, or if you choose, even your check instructors could administer final stage checks to all but their own students. 
Okay, so that that schedule time is a lot shorter than what we saw that you responded that it's, it's four weeks or more to get on a DPE schedule. Okay, and then talk about the rescheduling. Maybe that student didn't have the opportunity or chose not to keep their skills up, didn't do quite so well on the check ride. Now they have to schedule a recheck, another check ride. So that, they go back into that four week wait in a lot of cases. No check ride failures. How does that advertise? Pretty well. When you go, our students do not fail check rides. Okay? Let me brag a little bit. So we've got the 150 that we've done so far this year, the 500 that we've done overall, those people have not failed a check ride. The last time we had a DPE failure was August of last year. So we've gone all this year, we've done more, uh, issued more pilot certificates and ratings than any other school in the Commonwealth of Virginia and all of the schools combined in Northern Virginia with no failures. That's an easy one to sell to students. Reduce cost. Typically, the instructor piece of it, we charge a little bit more for doing the final stage check, and typically it's about $550 for a student, about half of what you would pay for a DPE. And oh, by the way, the DPE, they can be issued a little letter of disapproval. All they do is get turned back for a little training if they need some, some brush up. So uh, by doing it with a final stage check. Final stage check is always going to be conducted at their home airport. They're taking that final stage check with somebody that they know. They've seen that person around the flight school. The stress level is way down as opposed to meeting up with uh, somebody that they've never met for the first time and uh, taking the, a check ride with a possibility of failure with a stranger. For uh, most FISDOs have a rule that they, uh, since the, uh, there is a regulation that the DPE cannot act as the pilot in command on an instrument check ride, then they have to be conducted in, in visual meteorological conditions. Not so with a final stage check. Final stage check is part of training. So if we've got an instrument student that's up for a final stage check and it's an IMC day out there, let's go. Let's see what you got. This is what we're issuing you the ticket for. So we've got some flexibility that DPEs don't have uh, by doing this with examining authority. Now, this next one is not to, to say that DPEs are bad folks or, or the ASIs from the FISDO are bad. It's just the dynamic. Whenever the DPE knows that they are being evaluated and they have to be evaluated on an annual basis by their overseeing FISDO, the dynamic in that cockpit changes a lot. It takes away any discretion that they may otherwise exercise if they didn't have somebody sitting in the back seat looking over their shoulder. So uh, with that in mind, that, that's an uh, a tough situation to put an applicant in when the DPE is being evaluated. So they're gonna call, make the, the judgment calls a little bit closer so that they don't get scrutinized by the person sitting in the back seat. So there's, uh, under examining authority, there's much less of this going on because like I said, we only did 16 rides so far this year with DPEs. This is your plan of action. Each DPE and each final check instructor or assistant chief or chief has to go into the final stage check or the check ride with a plan of action. Everybody develops their own. If you've got a plan of action that you develop that's specific to your school, that's going to be a much more meaningful plan of action than one that was developed generically for a, a, by a DPE for application to all schools. 
It's a seamless customer experience. So when the customer comes into your school to get a pilot certificate, at the end of the day, it's you handing that customer the pilot certificate. Every time, as you know, as a uh, flight school owner, manager, chief instructor, any time you start depending on outside agencies to get things done, it complicates life quite a bit. So now this is all under your control. From the moment they walk in, you control the entire customer experience from start to finish, and you hand them the certificate. So they know it's you that made them a pilot. There's not somebody else involved. So there's also uh, similar advantages to the school. So the, the um, first thing is, if you've got a student that needs to travel to another airport to go take a check ride with a DPE, that airplane is scheduled out for the day. It's gone. So the student has to have time to pre-flight the airplane, make sure it's ready, travel to the other airport. And we saw that uh, beyond 30 nautical miles was a typical distance when uh, people needed to travel. Then they need to, that airplane sits idle while the oral is going on. Then they go take the check ride, they fly back, the airplane's gone for the day. When you are administering a final stage check, you can have a flight going on while the oral's taking place, the airplane is then available, and then you can have another flight go on uh, for the rest of the day. It ups your utilization on the aircraft. This one is huge. Uh, we heard Mary talk yesterday about, hey, um, I don't think flight instructors care at all about how their students do anymore because I'll have a student fail a check ride or maybe not fail a check ride, but they never call me to get my perspective on what happens. Well, all of the instructors who are providing these students, who are training these students, work for me. So they don't have an option on hearing about how their student did, did, and they don't get an option on what they're going to do to improve the performance of their future students. They are told what they were, are going to do to improve the performance of their students. That feedback is built into the school and consistently raises the level of performance of their students right up to the point that they walk in my office with that sheepy little look and say, uh, Bob, I got a class date with PSA on uh, next month. So right when they get to right where you want them, then, then they're off to the airlines. But until that point, their, their, uh, the level of proficiency of their students continues to rise. Gold seals. Uh, uh, we had uh, somebody talk about gold seal the other day. Uh, that's a normal, most of our instructors have gold seal certificates because it's a much easier process now. To get gold seal, they must have at least in 24 calendar months, uh, they have to have 10 applicants that pass, or 10 applicants with at least an 80% first time pass rate. That's not a problem for a first time, uh, or for a full time instructor with us. We definitely have the volume if they're full time. That 80% is locked in. Their, their students can't fail. So it's uh, absolutely not a problem. And uh, so you can really get uh, your, your instructors recognized. It's not that that does a whole lot for you, but when they do go forward to do that airline interview or wherever they're going on to next, whipping out that instructor certificate with a gold seal on top for people who know what they're looking at, it means something to their future prospective employers. It is valuable to them. We, this has increased our flow of standard CFIs. So one of the problems that this will also fix is if when you get examining authority for a CFI program, what we're gonna talk about 
believe it or not, CFI is a little bit easier than some of the other programs to get examining authority for. When you get that, people know that the first time pass rate for CFIs right now, according to the 2022 data published by the FAA, is 76.2%. They've got a one in four chance of failing their first time CFI certificate. If it's somebody going for CFI, they're probably on the track to becoming a professional pilot. They do not want to have to explain to a future employer why they failed a check ride or another check ride. Okay, so passing that check ride on a first try is a very valuable thing to people on that track. So going through a course and not having the possibility of a check ride failure is very valuable to those folks. And it's increased the ring of uh, where we draw CFI applicants from. The previous CFI ground class that we held, I had uh, one student from California, one from Texas, one from South Carolina, and one from Maryland. The one that we just finished up, uh, I had uh, one from New York and another one from Texas. So as people find out that your school has uh, uh, examining authority for CFI, you start getting CFI applicants in numbers that you didn't know. The previous class had uh, 22 people in it. This past class had 15 in it. So out of those, a number of them will complete training. And by the way, they are paying you to be standardized in that training to your school's standards so that they are ready to go when they graduate. They aren't people that you have had to recruit and, and hire from the outside and then spend your time and your money standardizing to your school's culture and your school's procedure. They're paying to get that done, okay? The, the advantages are huge. Uh, on the money side, they pay a higher fee, at least we charge a higher fee for the final stage check that's done. Uh, it's still a bargain. If they're paying $550 for the uh, uh, final stage check at our school, it sounds like I need to up that rate. But, and they're, as opposed to $950, they'll, they're gladly going to pay that so the uh, final, uh, the people conducting the final stage check are earning a higher rate and the school's cut of that is higher. So it's, it's a, a better profit center for you. And again, it's a, people get to understand, students talk that are training at different flight schools. Hey, you go to this school, it's a front to, to uh, finish. It's a better seamless experience. So we already talked about people traveling greater distances to get to uh, your school. You're, you'll find that where you're drawing students from, they're driving a farther distance, bypassing your competition to get to you. And the last thing is, if they're not sitting in here, if they're not already at school with examining authority, then you're now doing something that your competition is going to be, even if they start towards it, they're gonna be way behind you on getting this done. So, another question. Go ahead and pull out your cell phones. Do, uh, does any of your competition, another school within 50 nautical miles, have examining authority? All right, looks like we got a couple that do, mostly don't. Okay, for those who do have a school with examining authority within 50 nautical miles, it's time to play catch up and get something going for you that they already have. For those that don't, you will put yourself out there with something unique that uh, other schools in your area cannot do. Okay, so what's it take to become, to get examining authority? 
This is right out of the regulation. You have to be a non-provisional 141 school. So that means you have to have held a 141 certificate for more than 24 months. You have to have had that program or that course, private pilot for instance, for at least 24 months. Now here's the, the big part. We're gonna break this down for you. Within 24 months prior to the time that you apply, you had to have at least 10 applicants in that program in the previous 24 months. Of those 10 applicants, they have to have a um, pass rate of 90% for the practical, the knowledge test, or the combination of the two. And that's the secret right there. So let's say everybody out there is using King School products to uh, for train their people up in preparation for the knowledge test. What's going to be your your first time pass rate on knowledge tests? If it's anything like ours, it's going to be oh a, less than a percent, less than a hundred percent. Okay. Almost everybody is going to pass their knowledge test on the first attempt. So now, what's the, the percentage that you need to achieve on practical tests? That drops it down to 80%, okay? So if the national average for private pilot, according to the 2022 numbers from the, the FAA, is 96.9%, you're almost, all you gotta do is get your folks a little bit better than the national average. That's not too hard, okay? And private pilot is one of the most difficult to get it. So once you get private pilot, it's pretty much downhill from there. So those tests, uh, if you have an in-house DPE, that those, um, uh, tests cannot be given by your in-house DPE. They have to be given to, by somebody outside or by the FISDO. And uh, Mr. Crudden is going to talk here in a little bit about some changes that are coming on regulations that govern the, the uh, FISDO uh, administering some of those check rides. Okay. So the last thing that uh, you need to do is complete the application and then uh, forward that application to your POI at the FISDO. So the subpart delta in part 141 governs all of this. It's backed up by the uh, AC 141-1 uh, Bravo, which essentially just don't bother reading that because all it says is refer back to the uh, subpart delta. And it's, it's easy reading, it's about three pages. So it's, there's not a lot in there about examining authority. All right, so let's talk about uh, the, the couple of limitations that you've got. First off, you can only uh, give final stage checks for uh, people in your school in the course that's approved, okay? So it doesn't automatically approve you for all courses you can't give a six, uh, person that's trained under 61 a final stage check and then issue them a certificate. And you can't, let's say you had somebody from another 141 school that thinks that this is a good idea, you can't do that school. Only the people in your school for your approved courses. It's not applicable for reduced hour courses, how many have a reduced hour? Most commonly, it's the commercial course. Okay, I would highly recommend putting one of those together. Uh, it, we've got a, a reduced hour commercial that takes it from the required 120 hours uh, for a full up commercial course down to 60. So uh, our CFIs coming through that take advantage of that program are coming, getting their CFI certificate in less than 200 hours total time. And then special curricular courses under uh, 141.57. Those cannot be, uh, those are not eligible for examining authority. 
So the, uh, the other thing is that the FISDO, uh, and I put this in here as a limitation, but the FISDO will have to process the final paperwork unless you have a, an uh, Airman Certification Representative, an ACR. We're going to talk about that in a second. So how do we get there? Uh, there's some obstacles that we need to negotiate, but they're not insurmountable, and uh, so we're going to find out they're not what they used to be. So first off, you have to be a non-provisional 141 school. If you're, if you're one of the few folks that said that they were 141 provisional, then hang on, and, but use this time to start getting your things together and lined up so that as soon as you hit the 24-month mark uh, and you're not provisional any longer, you can then apply. Uh, get your procedures put together. So uh, uh, the procedures for each maneuver in the course that you're going after, uh, get that together, get your instructors well trained up on it. Identify the courses. You want to start with private pilot so that you get people starting through this track. We've got now three generations of pilots that have come through our program and have never seen a DPE. They don't know how to take an FAA check ride. All of their certificates from private through CFI, double I in some cases, have been issued through examining authority. So uh, focus on one at a time. Doing it all at the same time, trying to get your whole program approved is just uh, too big of an undertaking. When you start getting near the finish line on one course, start managing the programs. I had spreadsheets for each course. I knew name by name by name who needed to pass what knowledge test and what uh, final stage check. And you know, as those people are taking check rides, if somebody happens to have not a good day, then you just go back and redraw the line and say, okay, now this is the earliest date that I'll be able to gain examining authority for this program. It gets easier as you go along and your instructors and staff buy into the examining authority and what it's doing for your school, it gets progressively easier. Now, the, the part that makes it easy for the CFI, even though the CFI of all the certificates and ratings has the lowest first time pass rate, what makes it easier there is that CFIs take two knowledge tests. So John and Martha take care of two thirds of that approval for you. If they are 100% on their FOI, they're 100% on their flight instructor airplane on first time passes, now that drops your number down for CFI to 70%. Only 70% now need to pass the first time. Well, once again, the, the nationwide average is 76.2%. Uh, All you need to do is maintain the national average, not even anything special there. So the numbers start to work in your favor for CFI. And then that CFI one is the one that starts bringing a greater number of applicants to your school that you train at their expense. So uh, the next one is notify the FISDO. At about this point in time that you're getting this lined up, let your POI know, bring him, make, make your POI part of the solution so that because this is most likely going to be something new for your POI and your FISDO. So there's some education and train up that needs to be done. And I'm certain that uh, uh, Mr. Crudden's office and my POI would be happy to help. The, uh, bring your staff on board. Tell them about what needs to happen and the benefits that are gonna come to your school with this get their buy-in and let them know what your goals and timelines are so that they can start elevating the level of training for their students so that they can meet these requirements to get the check rides done when they need to be done. Okay, so what has to happen is we need to have a mindset change of we're not going to meet the minimums of the ACS or PTS. What needs to happen is 
you have to raise the standard so that your school, uh, your students exceed the standards of the ACS or the PTS, because only then will you guarantee yourself that you're gonna have the pass rate you need to get here, okay? So that doesn't mean we're going for perfection, that just means we're, gonna, we're just gonna be better than the ACS standards, okay? So then uh, one of the issues that, I, as I talk to other flight schools about this, is the DPEs, sometimes the DPEs don't uh, want to relinquish the control that they have on the market. We'll talk about that in a second. But talk to the selected DPEs that you know that you can trust to be part of this process. You're not asking them to turn into Santa Claus so that you can get the approval rate up. You're just telling them, hey, I'm going to do this. You don't want to surprise people that you work with. All right, so there's a little bit of gaming the system here to, to get there. We talked about a little bit of it already. If you have a student that's on your spreadsheet of this is one that I'm counting on to get there uh, for a check ride, and they happen to be one of those few that, that fail a knowledge test, then encourage them to take a part 61 check ride, okay? Because if they take a 141 check ride, they count. So now you've carried that one failure and you don't have very many opportunities there. You wanna get them off that list and so that they're replaced by somebody who has passed their knowledge test, okay? So that's the way to uh, help make the numbers work. As soon as you get 10 applicants and you've got that 90%, drop your application. It's the same application that you use to become a 141 school. It's the same application that you use to renew your 141 certificate every 24 months. Drop that application in there right then because if you have somebody take one more check ride, that's one more opportunity for a failure to jump in there and that may spoil you and reset you back to uh, uh, starting the process over again, okay? All right, once you get examining authority, you need to let the world know because you've got something going at your school now that, that the students in your area and, uh, need to know about and your competition can't do it. So announce it in print, social media, any way that you can. Put it out certainly to the people in your school and uh, uh, we do a couple of special things. We take pictures at the airplane. We take pictures when we're presenting the certificate. We took, uh, uh, we have a, a bell that people ring and uh, we just celebrate it as much as possible. They know where they got their certificate is at your school. So this is, uh, this was just last Friday. This is a, one of those CFI applicants. Uh, he, he's actually from California. Uh, came out and uh, did his CFI, just got his um, uh, CFI certificate on Friday, a week from ago uh, today. Yay! So, celebrate it. So, are there any obstacles uh, or barriers to, to getting examining authority? Yes, there are a few. So let's talk about how to address them. If you don't have the required number of applicants, the 10 and 24 months to get examining authority in that program, consider shifting people over from uh, part 61. So we already know if you're, uh, provide training, uh, VA approved training, you've got to lock on those people. They have to be 141. If you're part of a university program, those are all 141. Consider transferring people, encouraging people to go uh, 141 versus 61. That'll help get your numbers up there. If uh, the 90% is part of the challenge, then it's time to take a look, tighten up your pre, uh, the, whatever you're doing to prep people for their check rides. Look at tightening up those procedures as much as you can. And again, as we said, don't send the, uh, anybody who has not passed their 
knowledge test on the first attempt, don't send those people for a 141 check ride. Here we get into the fun ones. I've heard this from some of the, the Florida schools. As soon as the DPEs find out that you're going for examining authority, they know that that's going to undermine your business, especially if you're a bigger school that sends them a lot of business. Okay? So, step number one, talk to them about it. Say, uh, because in, in talking this over with other DPEs, they, they're disgusted by this notion. So, if that's if you're encountering this, there's a couple of ways to deal with it. One, talk to the FISDO. The, the FISDOs oversee their operation. Say, hey, not trying to toss anybody under the bus here, but this is what we see happening. Maybe on these key check rides, can they be observed just to make sure that people are, are operating fairly? Okay? If you really want to take off the gloves and go ugly, then you can talk about, uh, well, we're paying you more than $600, and according to IRS regulations, anybody that you pay more than $600 to, we need to provide a 1099. So let's do 1099s for each. Uh, and because this, as we all know, this is a real cash business, and we're not charging it on credit cards. If you really want to go ugly, uh, there's an option. Okay, then the other one that we commonly hear is the, I've talked to my FISDO about examining authority, I qualify, but I, uh, they say that they don't have the manpower to support it. Okay, so Mr. Crudden's going to talk a little bit more about it uh, in a moment, but actually they don't have that option. In 2009, there was a flight school in Tulsa, Oklahoma that uh, had applied for examining authority. They had met the requirements for examining authority, and the FISDO said they don't have the manpower to support it. He sent a letter to the general counsel of the FAA. The general counsel in 2010 came back with a legal interpretation that said this. One, that uh, if a, uh, the FAA will issue examining authority to a pi uh, pilot flight school that meets the requirements, this comes right out of subpart D in 141. Here's the golden sentence. This is the second, these are three sentences out of the middle uh, of the second paragraph of this letter. Here is the golden one. And David and Nida, this is why you came to San Diego. The FAA does not have the dis discretion to deny examining authority to a school that satisfied the requirements. Okay? That is their legal interpretation governing them, their own operations. That's nothing that anybody outside of the FAA has done. Okay? So it's not based on their workload ability. It's if you meet the requirements, you will be awarded examining authority. Then this was further backed up by a, a court ruling uh, that said that we will issue examining authority as long as the school meets the qualifications of that course. Okay? Those are the three sentences verbatim out of the second paragraph of the Milner letter. It's worth, if you haven't seen it before, Google the Milner letter, and there it is. Okay, so what's it take to retain examining authority once you have it? Is it a, uh, since it is a, a big chunk of trust that the FAA has put in your school, well, it's got to be complicated to hold on to it. Well, not really. Must have held the, the, uh, rating for that course for at least 24 months. Well, you had to have that to qualify to get it in the first place. So this is really nothing additional. And by the way, that's another CFI. And where's, where's my UND guy? Where's Alan? Yep, 
that's uh, 603 November Delta. There's a UND plane right there. Uh, this is a CFI check ride being uh, administered Tuesday. Uh, so must apply for the renewal of examining authority. This is just done in the normal part of your 24 month renewal process. Same application, nothing special. You just check off the, the appropriate box for flight only examining authority. No real additional effort required at all to retain it. Just so you don't screw it up, it's yours. So we said we'd talk about the ACR. The last piece of it is, and the um, uh, as much as I wanted to get ACR, I think, I don't know if it was the, the FISDO, my POI, that wanted me to get it more because it's a huge workload for them to process all the paperwork coming out of your school for each student for each of these certificates. Because now that they pretty much are out of doing check rides themselves, this puts them back into the process of, of dealing with all of these certificates. So they would very gladly relinquish that back to the school, which on our part, even though it's more work admittedly than I thought it was going to be, having that moment where you are the one issuing each student the pilot certificate is invaluable. So we gladly do that. Uh, so the ACR or the school, it doesn't matter who actually hands it to them, but the ACR is the one that does the paperwork processing to uh, generate the temporary certificate. That's done at the school. So the student, again, it's that seamless experience, gets it from the school, not from the FISDO, not from a DPE, they get it from you. It's easier to celebrate. You don't have some stranger hanging around there. You give them the certificate, you take the pictures, you ring the bell, you celebrate however you're going to celebrate that. It also keeps a consolidated record. At any moment, I know exactly what certificates have been issued at my school for whatever period I want to do it because it's all held in the designee management system database and it's very easy to, to keep track of all that information. It's about 30 minutes total per student. Okay, so if you've got a student that has, uh, gets weathered out or they're not ready, they, they uh, have to retake something, it's, it's another couple of additional minutes, but about 30 minutes per student. And that's the processing that the FISDO is perfectly happy to hand back and have us do. What's it take to be an a, uh, ACR? 21 years old, don't have to be a, don't have to be a US citizen, have to have at least a commercial pilot certificate with an instrument rating. The reason instructor isn't in there, I believe, is that at the airlines, they don't require instructors to, uh, uh, airline instructors to hold an instructor certificate. They can be, an ATP can provide airline level instruction. So they have to have a good piloting record uh, regarding accidents, incidents, and violations. Now, this is one I, the next one I kind of pulled over on my FISDO. Uh, I don't know how I got away with this, but somehow it happened. And must have been in a chief instructor position or management position, admin position at the school for more than 12 months. And they must, this is the tricky one, they must be superior to the chief instructor. I think because I was also the owner, they, they said, okay, in that hat, then, then he's superior to the chief instructor, even though it's one and the same person. Okay, any current DPE immediately qualifies to be an ACR for that particular school. No, uh, it's, a, it, it's an administrative appointment. Okay. Any questions? And uh, uh, Mary Shu named all of hers. Uh, I, I guess this is the uh, Michael Jordan uh, jump. So uh, any questions on examining authority before we bring on Mr. Crudden? I want to uh, add one point that um, I ran into. You talk about two years to get off provisional certificate. If you read the regulation, it's with 
in 24 months. So make sure that everybody's aware that if you get 10 students and you get the successful pass rate, that could be six months. It could. Okay. It so absolutely you could. don't have to wait from initial no. 141 provisional two full years. Excellent point, Brian. That was just awesome, Bob. Uh, here's the nuance, and, and this is a tough one. We've had a flight school 141 for years, right? And then our pass rate went below 80%. So now we're provisional until we get our pass rate above 80. So does anyone know, do I have to wait 24 months once we get back to non-provisional status? Or does it just be, or does it just continue from, we already had 24 months. That's probably a tricky one, huh? Okay, but to apply for EA then, do we, we have to wait when we're just done with the new provisional because we screwed up and we got too low? Resets the clock. Ah, bummer. Okay, thank you. And we're doing exactly what you said. As soon as we get our 10, we're going to... Yeah, as soon as you get 10, go for it. Drop that application. about this other point. Um, so what happens with PREA? I mean, lots of times the Pilot Records Improvement Act is looking at failures. So now all these folks that are in 141, I assume no one's coming to you for PREA and you're PREA free at this point, huh? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, well, PREA actually doesn't ask the question about failures. It's not PREA, that happens in the interview process. Yeah, PREA is just mostly focused on uh, drug and alcohol violations. Uh, they don't ask about check ride failures. Now, some airlines are savvy enough, and as I uh, imagine is if more examining authority schools come online, they're going to know to ask, okay, did you go to a school with examining authority. Now, did you have to retake any final stage check is the educated question there to get the information that they want. But if the question is asked, do you have any check ride failures? The answer is no, because I never took a check ride. So, you, know you, got, you, got, you got Bill English working for you. So let's say the, they have an accident, right? And they get a blue ribbon on the pilot. I imagine it's just not going to come up unless the accident investigator really digs, right? That's right. Yeah, nobody's going to cover up. Nobody's going to cover up any information, and and certainly uh, my POI has got a password into our. We use the the King Schools program, so all of our stuff is in the the course tracking application. He's got a password. He can sit there at home in his pajamas and go through my 141 records anytime he wants. So it's it's not a secret, and and it's not really out there red letter that hey this person was turned back. But you would just see that uh, they had uh, instructor Tom Smith, instructor Tom Smith, uh, Robert Hep on a on a. Um, you know, like a four alpha or an eight alpha final stage check. And then he went back to Tom Smith and then back to Robert Hepp for another four alpha or eight alpha. And for somebody who knows what they're looking at, they know, okay, he went back, you know, it looks like somebody's logbook that failed a check ride. So it, it's, there's no secret, but the, the, um, the sec what's different is it's a check ride versus a final stage check that is part of training. Okay, so it matters on, and, and I coach our people going to the airlines on how to answer that question. If, if they are asking about um, you getting additional training after a final stage check, the last thing you wanna do is lie to them about it. I used to do pilot interviews for an airline and if, some, if we thought that somebody was being untruthful with us about something, boom, end of discussion. You're out the door. Uh, if, 
if the uh, chief pilot or somebody else on staff of a flight school is a DPE, uh, are there still advantages to getting examining authority? Uh, yes, uh, because that if he's operating as a DPE, then what happens is a check ride and with the possibility of a failure. What happens under examining authority is a final stage check that is part of training without the possibility of a failure. Yeah, I was just curious because you mentioned a couple of times about DPEs being on staff, so it makes me think that you know of some of those uh, occurrences. We've never had one. Okay. Uh, and uh, some some schools just, I think, more by circumstance or happenstance end up with them, but you don't see too much of it anymore. Right. One follow-on question to that. Do you know of any uh, restrictions for a DPE that's on staff given check rides to students of that school? Uh, that used to be more commonplace. Uh, I, I don't know. Does anybody here know of that situation at their school or some other school? Yeah. Now, is it a, if you're applying for examining authority, then that cannot happen for those 10 qualifying rides. Um, so we've been in pursuit of this for quite a bit. And uh, I guess in this question, I'm a two-part question, but first one, I'm looking for some adv advisement. Um, so our POI has made the interpretation that only the practical exam counts towards the 90% pass rate. And currently we have an 88% pass rate just in the practical, so obviously above that we would be well set. Um, any type of advice on how to persuade this POI? No persuading required. Maybe reading lessons, but uh, they just, it's very clear. What I had up there is verbatim out of subpart delta, and it says or combination. Agreed, and we have made that argument to him to uh, over the past four or five years, and uh, and to his boss as well, and we have not had uh, success. Yeah, well then, uh, it, it, the uh, FAA website has a, a section on frequently asked questions. That may be answered in the frequently asked questions. Uh, some of them are, some of them aren't. Otherwise, it's just, uh, you know, you need to bump it up till you get to somebody like Mr. Crudden here who can say, no, no, this is the way it's supposed to read. How about now? There we go. Um, is there a time frame of when they could come out? So at one point, even with the practical, we did manage to get above 90, 90% and uh, submit, but it took them six or seven months to come out and evaluate us. And of course, at that point, we had fallen back below the 90% threshold, and then we were no longer um, considered for the examining authority at that point. Why don't I introduce this gentleman and invite him into yeah. the conversation? Hold, hold that thought. Okay. So this is called passing the buck. The, uh, uh, the uh, next gentleman that's uh, going to follow up is uh, Mr. Mike Crudden. And uh, let me tell you just a quick story. Uh, when um, Brian asked me to come out and talk about examining authority and I was putting the presentation together, I knew that there were going to be questions and interest just like that. And I went to my POI and asked if he would do a little pre-recorded three-minute video to answer these kind of questions and that I could put up there. I, I never dreamed that he or anyone else would uh, commit the resources and time to come to San Diego to participate. He said, okay, sounds good to me. Let me talk to the boss. And I thought, okay, here we go. And, uh, no way this is gonna happen. He took it to the boss, called me the next day, and he said, I spoke to Mr. Crudden, yeah, and he is excited about supporting this. And so 
he agreed then not only to make a recording covering these kind, Mr. Crudden himself is here. My POI's boss traveled across the country to be here to talk to you about this issue and, and reality on how it affects the FISDO. So uh, he's in a much better position to talk about uh, timelines. We kind of made it a, hey, this is new for everybody. We're all kind of learning as we went through the initial approval process. So it was like some kind of different and fun. Uh, and let's see, see what we can do. So it may be a you know, different kind of a, an environment where you are. But um, uh, it, it means the world to me that my FISDO manager took the time to come out here and support this today. Absolutely. Bob, to answer the first part of that uh, question, it's you're seeing just like flight schools. We have a lot of green instructors because most of the senior ones have been gobbled up by the airlines. We're seeing the same thing at some FISDO offices. Okay, and we don't necessarily know exactly where what their background was. It could have been totally part 61. Okay, now they're coming in and they're managing 141. Okay, so don't be afraid if they say something. Remember back to your CFI check ride? Are you sure about that? I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee. Why don't you look that up? Okay, don't. ask him, show me the chapter and verse. You're demanding this, what backs it up? So that's something that we can, you know, don't be afraid to ask. All right, Michael, please. On to the next, okay, good morning. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that situ situations like that, uh, the nature of really what this is going to be about. It's uh, the, the technical topic is going to talk about examining authority quite a bit, but it's really going to be about how to better communicate with your FISDOs around these situations and to have the outcome be correct. So um, Bob mentioned I'm Mike Crudden. I'm the manager of the Washington FISDO. That's the Washington over on the Atlantic, not the one up on the Pacific Coast, so uh, I was happy to, uh, to, to be invited to, uh, to come and join you all, to come and talk about this. Uh, this kind of outreach is one of the most important things that we do uh, in the FAA, so actually I very sincerely appreciate the chance to come and talk about this and try to uh, help provide some perspective on what the FISDO is seeing and how we can look toward a solution. So fundamentally, my job, um, we have about 20 inspectors in our office of, of various specialties. Fundamentally, my job as an office manager is to ensure our policy is executed in accordance with the regulation and our policy. Sometimes that is relatively straightforward and everything works out just fine. Sometimes it gets complicated and examining authority is one of those areas where we do encounter complications from time to time. And hopefully this talk will help highlight ways that you can work with your FISDO, General Aviation Safety Assurance at large and the FAA to have the outcome be what is appropriate to the circumstances. So I don't want to say further communication is going to necessarily result in what you were hoping to get, but it should be the correct outcome. So let me talk a little bit about some of the details and I will make my way uh, over this way. Um, there was talk about the, the increased demand in the, in the pilot certification arena. That is true. That's happening. This is an article I came across uh, earlier this, uh, this month um, as I was preparing for this. And the, uh, the demand for certification is increasing, and we see that, and, uh, and we hear that in, uh, in the FISDOs and uh, in General Aviation Safety Assurance, and we recognize, and there have been some efforts to increase the availability of designees. Uh, we've removed the geographic boundaries uh, of those designees so that they can serve where the demands are uh, without creating additional um, complications that will prevent time for those check rides so we can have that service delivery occur. Um, but truly, when we look at delegation, and, and, and examining authority is, is, in essence, an extension of delegation, uh, this goes way back in FAA history. So delegation was a part of the original design of the FAA back in 1958, the FAA Act of 1958. goes way back. Actually, if you, go, if, you, if you look at the medical side of it, they go even further back to the 20s uh, in the Airmail Act when we had... Uh, medical examiners uh, being designated, doctors being designated to perform medical examinations on pilots operating in commerce. So it goes way, way back, not a new thing. Uh, and also examining authority was a part of the original 141 rule design back in the late 70s. So not a new concept, but it is uh, uh, unfamiliar 
to, to many in the 141 community, uh, but it is there, it is real, and it is an option. So um, speaking broadly to pilot certification, we know there are basically three paths. One is to call me or, or one of my uh, 2,500 friends in uh, GA Safety Assurance and request a check right from the FISDO, which we will take that request and we will fulfill that request uh, as soon as we are able, but I think as many of you have experienced, that's a challenge. I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that is too, just again, to sort of help, help the conversation, help the understanding of, of how these issues come together. Uh, there's, of course, the designated pilot examiners, the DPEs. We've talked about that, fairly traditional. Uh, I mentioned we have attempted to increase those numbers and to make those designees more available to you all in the schools across the country so that your students can get check rides. I don't think there's anybody in this room, anybody in the FAA or anywhere that has an interest in delaying a student from their point of completion of training to receiving that check ride. We know that that's not, the more time that goes along, uh, that's in that space is not helpful. So, uh, so let's, with this audience, 141, we're really here talking about examining authority as Mr. Hep uh, started uh, before me. So um, applying, preparation, review the documents, review the rule. The rule's pretty straightforward. I think we've, uh, some of you have seen that. There's, there's not a lot in there as rules go, which is, uh, which is helpful for clarity. Uh, you apply to us on the form. If you've ever wondered what those check boxes are on the application for the pilot school application, it is for examining authority. So that's when you check those boxes when you, uh, when you are intending to formally go down that path and apply for examining authority. And we mentioned the data reflecting the performance. 10 schools, or 10 students, 90% pass rate. Uh, in knowledge, and to the, to the question, uh, I even put it in my presentation, knowledge and practical tests. So uh, we'll, we can have a separate uh, discussion about that. Uh, but here I want to, this is where I was hoping to get to, the best practices. So um, how is, how can we make this work ideally uh, for, for everybody involved, the FISDO and the, uh, the school? Uh, communication. Communicate early. I can't recommend waiting until you get that 90% pass rate. Certainly drop, you know, apply to the office as soon as you meet the eligibility requirements. I agree with that fully. However, there's a lot of benefit to starting that conversation very, very early. So if you do intend to go down the examining authority path, I would highly recommend reaching out, having a conversation with your assigned principal operations inspector, possibly even office management, uh, if you think that that would be uh, of benefit, and tell them that you are going down this path. So now that may invite more uh, time with, uh, with uh, the inspectors from your, your local FISDO, but again, that is part of the process. So we do have that provision in our policy where we may examine or should examine up to 50% of your applicants in preparation for issuing examining authority. Uh, unfortunately, the way that it tends to happen practically is we receive an application for examining authority. It's sort of a surprise to everybody in the FISDO. And now this, there is this policy requirement, which I'm obligated to attempt to fulfill, to fulfill, uh, which is that uh, we now have to examine 50% of the candidates uh, for that. And we're fresh out of time machines at the FAA. I don't know about you guys, there's some pretty neat technology out there, but going backwards is a challenge. So it leaves us in this space of me as an approving official for that air agency certificate, I can't sign a certificate where I know there's a policy requirement that has not been met. However, as was pointed out, that policy is, still, is subject to uh, other considerations where the surveillance obligations or the surveillance plans of the FAA are not an obligation of the applicant. So it is not necessarily a barrier. However, there is a policy question in there. And if the response highlights that requirement as a reason that examining authority can't proceed, I would recommend continuing that conversation with the FISDO, reaching out to the local FISDO management team and talking about the situation and see where that conversation goes. Ideally, handling, having those conversations at the local level, that, that's where the approval is going to come from. But if after those additional conversations locally, you're not able to agree, we do have a process within the FAA where that can be elevated to uh, through the agency, it's our consistency and standardization initiative, and that can be assessed by others outside of the, of the local office. And there is no problem with doing that. 
That is the process. It's what's there, as I said earlier. My obligation is to make sure the policy is fulfilled. And if I can receive guidance from our policy division that there is a way to meet that policy requirement or that it is otherwise fulfilled, we can move ahead. But that isn't a decision that can, uh, is, is challenging for the local FISDO to make because the, the job of the local FISDO is to execute FAA policy and of course within the parameters of the regulation. So we're in this space of this is how it's written and this is what we have to do, but that's okay. In those scenarios, we should have those additional conversations so that we can get to the right place based on the circumstances of that application. Um, a schedule of events. Be specific with us on timeline. We're thinking about examining authority five years from now. And we're gonna say, okay, great. We'll, we'll check in with you. If you provide us a specific timeline, that does help give us some guidance on where we can position our staff to support your request. And like all things, the more time we have beforehand, the better. So the sooner you can start those conversations with your local FISDO office and your certificate management team, the better that this will tend to avoid some of these challenges uh, like, uh, like the timeline issue, which it is, and for the timeline to your que specific question, sir, um, that, that's a hard and fast regulation. So there's limited, uh, there's not a lot we can do in that space. When the, when, when the time frame has been exceeded, but it's, it's certainly something that it sounds like could have been avoided if we, had, if we could have started the process sooner. Um, so it, 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 but there is, yeah, fundamentally in those scenarios where, where hands are, our hands are somewhat tied in that. Um, but uh, but it, it, like most things, I, we, we try to be in the prevention business, and this is, this is one of those arenas too. We don't want to drag out a project to miss a time frame of evaluation or qualification we, we, we want to meet that. If you meet the requirements as the regulations provide, you're entitled to receive that authority. Ask questions. If you're hearing information from your certificate management team that doesn't sound right, um, have a conversation. You know, we, we, we do, when we get into these technical subject matters, it does tend to be, you know, I, I, um, it can become a little charged at times. I, I don't recommend that. Uh, I don't think that that, helps us get to the end any sooner. Uh, I think it's just a matter of it's okay to have principled disagreements, and there is a process for working those disagreements out. So you should absolutely uh, feel at liberty to engage in that process. Have it talk to the local FISDO management, ask for me, ask for your local FISDO manager. If you haven't met them, there's 77 of them around the country, 78 including me. Uh, we will absolutely talk with you and explain the situation as we see it. And it may be a scenario where the management team is not aware and needs to get into the details of what's happening with the certificate, which we are absolutely glad to do. Again, our obligation is to fill, fulfill the policy and ensure it's executed appropriately and correctly. Um, other additional things to support uh, ongoing working with your local FISDO, you can ask to, uh, for access to the SAS external portal. Uh, that is a system that we use to manage your oversight, but it's a system that you can actually have a role in and you can sort of help the inspector do the work that they need to do around these additional authorities. And basically, it gives you the option to fill out what we call DCTs, data collection tools. You can go in and answer the questions for the inspector. Here's where we have this for examining authority. Here's where we have our data. You can basically prepare the thing that they will need to do to click approve to move your request forward. So that is one thing that you might consider doing, along with the web ops system, which is uh, also a, another thing where you can uh, help move uh, the uh, process along uh, on your behalf and get that done sooner, because sometimes there are some delays in, uh, in preparing those letters of authorization. Okay, so inside the FISDO, so what's happening after you drop off that 8420? Um, any given day at a FISDO, we are continuously prioritizing what is happening in our respective areas. So for me, uh, our office covers Northern Virginia, the District of Columbia, and Southern Maryland, so we have a few things going on from time to time. Um, the challenge that we have in the FISDOs is that the new thing that came into the office often tends to be one of the highest priorities. The challenge is, uh, for example, accidents, incidents, occurrences. They, unfortunately, they happen. They happen more than, uh, you know, of course, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to put ourselves out of business. We're really trying to drive the rate of all of that to zero. And I know you're all trying to help in that regard. But the challenge we have is as those happen, now those tend to become unanswered questions of 
uh, compliance and safety. So the airplane that had an engine failure, why did the engine failure occur? Uh, is there an issue with the fleet? Is there an issue with the type design? Again, there are all these things that put those things right up on the top. So basically, every, every hour, we're constantly having more things put ahead of the things that may have come in behind those requests because of the risk that's represented by the potential risk that's represented by those reports that we are obligated to look into. So, so that's kind of what's happening in the background of the FISO. It's a constant reprioritization and new things coming in and we apply risk-based decision making to decide what's gonna go first. And that's just a little look behind the scenes of the FISDO. The pilot school requests will generally go to your certificate management team. Uh, we may bring in other inspectors from, from uh, that you have not met before, either in the office or from local offices or from around the country. We, uh, several years ago, we've, we've, we've taken great strides to remove our geographic boundaries and we can pull in resources from uh, around the country if we need to. So that is, uh, that is an option and certainly is an option for, for the 141 arena. The, of course, the challenge is, again, resources as a total for all of general aviation safety and flight standards, which, which continue to be a challenge for us. But ultimately, your application comes in, uh, it's assigned by the management team, the CMT evaluates, and then we're following the procedures, in our case, generally of the 8900, which is our inspector order, which is what tells us as inspectors how we need to look at these things coming into the office. So it's not a requirement for the public. However, I would highly, highly encourage you to become familiar with that, well, the, <laughs> the portions of that document that apply to your, your world. and uh, and. Uh, develop some expertise around that. So if you're applying for examining authority, it's kind of like having a copy of the test before the exam actually comes. You can see exactly what the inspector should be looking for. And if in your view, you have met all those benchmarks and produced that data and met those requirements, and there's a disagreement on the outcome, there should definitely be some additional conversation around that. So I can't, I, I can't recommend that enough versus uh, accepting a position which you don't believe to be correct. That's not right either. So please reach out to your local FISDO management teams and we will absolutely ensure that that is uh, evaluated quite broadly in, uh, in the FAA to make sure that the outcome is correct. All right, requirements examining authority, uh, as uh, Mr. Hepp mentioned, uh, must be equal in uh, scope, depth, and difficulty. It is, in essence, the same check ride. Uh, there's some additional record keeping that goes with that that was mentioned. Many of you are doing that in the course of your pilot school uh, management anyway, but there are some requirements that are specific to examining authority, but uh, um, just as a note. Um, but now in terms of the extra things that come into play as being an examining authority holder, the provisions of the ACS that talk about being an examiner now apply to your check pilots. So whomever is providing that final stage check now has to go to the back of the ACS and all of those elements apply. So the development of plans of action, consideration of the knowledge test, development of scenarios, that all has to happen. So, so there is some uh, lift that does come with holding examining authority, executing examining authority, um, but our uh, so now that, uh, so instead of simply being a final stage check, that stage instructor is now me, is now an aviation safety inspector, evaluator, to use the broad term, sitting in that seat, delivering that check ride as if they were the administrator. Um, we, we already mentioned the reduced hour courses. So, so considerations for examining authority. Public trust. Uh, certainly a, a, a big term for the FAA, but as your a, authority expands, your obligation to the public also expands. Uh, the public at large, certainly even the GA community, but even outside the GA community, uh, highly intolerant of the notion of something in aviation not being done correctly. The notion that a check ride was incomplete, improper, partial, not the correct depth, scope, and length, not well tolerated by the public. So, so there is a public trust element to this work. It's the work that we, certainly the work that we do as inspectors, and as we all do as uh, pilots and flight instructors too. But as that gets more formalized in an examining authority context, uh, 
only serves to highlight the demands that are placed on you in executing that role appropriately, thoroughly, and correctly every time, which is a lot to ask, but uh, is certainly an option if, uh, if the school chooses to pursue it. Uh, Mr. Hepp mentioned the uh, Airman uh, Certification Representative Authority, also an expansion to support the um, administrative side once the final stage check is complete and putting a certificate in the hand of the student. Uh, on the balance, tends to be something that I would recommend pursuing, but is fundamentally a decision for you all to look at individually as pilot schools. All right, further best practices, I'm gonna say it again, communication, ongoing, consistent, uh, collaborative. Um, talk to your POI about what their concerns might be, what they think they're seeing, and use that as an opportunity to potentially address that or point out where, in fact, they are doing that thing where potentially your, your inspector is not seeing that. So invite them in. I know that that's not a lot of people inviting the FISDO out to the airport these days, but, uh, but I can't recommend it enough. Much like uh, the invitation I received to come here, I truly am, uh, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here with you all talking about this today and uh, frankly wish I got to do it more. And I think that opinion shared by, uh, by many of my colleagues in, in FISDOs around the country. So, so engagement. High recommendation of, of, of anything I say today, engagement with your local office on what their concerns are, working forward to a uh, satisfactory conclusion. Uh, training and standardization. Is anybody familiar with the training rules of examining authority? Answer should be no. There aren't any. 90% pass rate, 10 students, you get examining authority. Uh, has anybody ever acted in the capacity as an examiner? here in the room? So there's a gap there. Um, it's a gap that I recommend bringing up to your local offices if you are planning to pursue examining authority because there are some nuances to serving in that role that I would recommend that your schools implement a training program for your check instructors who are conducting final stage check. I can't recommend it enough. And if you're looking for uh, some guidance on that, and I know that you're not uh, air operators, but if you look at the 135 rules, if you look at the 121 rules, they have a basic outline of what their check pilots, uh, basic training that they have to complete to serve in those roles. It all applies to 141 check instructors also, not by regulation. So this becomes an area of uh, a voluntary choice by your schools to choose to do that. But I, I, I do think that there is a lot of space in our pilot school world for voluntary safety, for doing things that make sense. Many of you are probably doing this anyway with your instructors um, for just because you think it's a good idea. There are a lot of good ideas out there. Put it in writing. Write up a couple of pages about how you want to train these stage examiners and hand that to your FISDO. Well, yeah, we're not just going to start doing this, Mr. POI, here. We have a plan for training our examiners. We have some record keeping procedures in place. And, and I think that that will help the conversation in terms of what is being asked for and how it will be managed, which I think goes unsaid quite a bit in these conversations. Uh, I also want to highlight uh, examining authority is not a function of getting very good at getting ready for check rides. Examining authority is a function of well-prepared students from highly effective training programs. The benefit of 141 is the structure of the training and the way that it is administered or presented to the student in a logical manner the focus should be on the training program. If the outcome of that highly effective training program is examining authority, that's great. But fundamentally, highly well-prepared students for whatever evaluation they may take, whether that's with a DPE, an aviation safety inspector, or for their examining authority, the focus should be on the training. And when that's the case, the certainly everybody has a, a you know, a, Bad days, ha bad days happen in the check ride world, right? We've seen that. We've seen that with our students. It's often the one you least think is going to have a problem during the check ride, has a problem during the check ride, and you know, here we are, you know, doing retraining for a for a very well prepared student. So we know that's there, and then we know that that's you know that's where the the hundred percent is is probably not a number that we're, we we would ever expect to see uh, a, a, as a pass rate, but we should sure get pretty close to approaching it because that number isn't representative of examining authority, it's representative of the quality of your training program, and that's fundamentally the requirement of 141. Okay. 
Questions? Yes, ma'am. So once we have examining authority, the getting the 90% in with the 10 bodies, okay, then you 100% have passes, I guess. Okay. Right? So do you keep tracking well, the passes? So back to the record keeping comment, you must, keep, you must keep track of the outcome of their first evaluation. So different okay. schools do that different ways. Is that an unsat? Is that you know, how, how that's reflected as a function of your record keeping program? But there is a requirement to, to track that performance. And if the outcome of the final stage check was anything other than satisfactory, you could have an incomplete, right? So, I mean, discontinuances happen. You're not issuing pink slips, but that's not an unsat. So you would want your record keeping system to reflect that. Most of the structured programs do in their way. The, the, the key piece there would be to make sure that there is some, uh, you've created a procedure or policy to reflect. That's what that means when it's in the system that way. And then we're still looking at the compliance of a 90% or higher to maintain that examining authority. Actually, no. Uh, that's the piece. So 90% is the initial threshold to be issued examining authority. Once you hold it, uh, the default requirement of 141 applies at your renewal, 80%. Then second question, um, splitting ground and flight. So we could do flight on one day, ground on another? Uh, the ACS does, I uh, do not believe that it allows for that. Okay. But I'd have to check. Comments? Yeah, pretty much have to have the intent. Now you can't control the weather. Okay, intent. Yeah. So just like a regular check ride then. Um, is there guidance for the POI? Because I know they have a lot, they're, they're spread thin across a lot of different topics. How can I help our POI to say, here, go here or talk to these people or Gene Hardy or something like that? That's, that's so in our, in our FAA parlance, that would be AFS 800. They're the policy division. They're the folks that write that 8900.1 for our inspectors. So that would be something that you could suggest to, to the principal uh, if there's some type of disagreement on how they're evaluating what you're, you're asking for. Um, but you might also ask if you could have a group meeting with the management team, the local management team, and take a look at exactly what you are asking for and see if there isn't a way to bridge that uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, yeah, you could recommend AFSC 100 if they're not familiar. We do have, with the, with the hiring that we have happening, we do have many new inspectors coming in. Uh, so, so it may be a benefit to, to help point them in that direction. The examining authority topic is a tough one. There's not a lot on it. So that's where some of those conversations may be necessary. And that's perfectly fine. Well, that's great to hear you guys are hiring also. Um, <laughs> Last question, the FAA oversight to piece to this might already be addressed in the record keeping system, but I want a, a two part question really. Initially, when you ask for examining an authority, there's this piece where they're supposed to evaluate so many. We've you know, been asking for it for years and they you know, okay, don't have the, you know, the manpower, those kinds of things. But it's very ambiguous how it's written and some POIs will be like, well, I'll intend to, and if I do one or two rides, or so what's your interpretation, or what is the real right. final? So I think that's where, what my recommendation would be, start that conversation early, yeah. as opposed to, I've given you a piece of paper, now, now figure out if there's risk around this to issue you an authority. So, it's, so that's the inspector's thinking on that, typically, is I haven't looked at any of this, I haven't seen any of this from a performance standpoint, and Theoretically, on paper, this could just be approved and go forward, and we've never looked at anything, and that's usually a pretty uncomfortable place for any of our inspectors to be. So if you're thinking about exa examining authority, just start that conversation a year before, before you even have anyone pass your program, and at least then the local office is aware that that is a path you're pursuing and that you intend to okay. gain okay. that authority. All right, part B and final question. No, it's okay, please, I appreciate um, it. 
once you have examining authority, what is the FAA oversight involved there? Is it just your two-year renewal, or do they come along and do certain rides? Not, not that it's we a may. problem, but... We may. So expanded authority expands our potential concerns for ongoing adequacy of that author exercise of that authority. So you're likely to see more of us in the context of examining authority. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Mary. And while we're walking over to this table, there was another question that came up that, Michael, you may be able to answer or uh, was even going to ask Bob. Um, on There was new uh, push to try to see students finish their check ride within a two-week window. And it's uh, proposal, legislation, things like that. I don't remember. Uh, Bob, if you wanted to talk, maybe I'll, I'll give it to Mary first with your question. Uh, on Brian's uh, uh, point, Fasana led the industry to get geographic expansion, as you know, from our federal friend. Um, we're now leading to create a central office in Washington. And it sounds like you'd be a great leader in that office, by the way. <laughs> so we'll, we'll put, a, we'll put a, a point in for you. I'd have to commute more. <laughs> uh, okay. the, the key is, and I know, you know, I hear what Cirrus is talking about, um, we're in ongoing discussions as the trade association with the FAA because not all of your counterparts um, perhaps deliver the same KPIs. Um, and that's not a negative statement. Okay. But Understood. It, 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 it is what it is, you know. And I just had a call this morning with, uh, with Trey McClure, as a matter of fact. He <laughs> called me on something. Um, there's no question on the two-week uh, certification, you know, to get a check ride, And that's why the central office uh, language is being proposed in Congress that we're pushing very hard. The, the self-examining authority We've had at least a dozen calls. We had a big meeting in Dallas with about 40 of our members just several weeks ago. And we're about to drop a letter to high up at FAA on changes to 141. It, one of the outcomes from the meeting in Dallas with our many good members there, small schools, medium-sized schools, large schools, was, well, how do you get to this SEA if you've already been in business? Um, and that 90% is, is not easy. It is not easy. You know, people said, maybe we, do we start a new school? Do we start a new 141, you know, so to speak? Um, but th those are some of the comments that I can share, I think, on this, on this comment period. But the, that two-week period, uh, going back when Jay Kitchens, you know, was the Trey McClure, Jay had agreed with us nationally that two weeks was great with him. And so we're still looking for that two week, that 14 day to get that check right. And it should be able to be done. Otherwise, when you start going four and six and eight weeks out, there needs to be remedial training. You know, students yeah. learn that rote memory. Yeah, and, and, and like we mentioned during the, during the talk, it's, it's for a student to be in that situation, a, a person getting their, their private pilot certificate, waiting, that, that's, that's, that's tough on the applicant. We don't, we don't want that for anybody. So um, in those, between now and whatever happens next with uh, some folks that uh, I've never met, um, include that as part of the conversation with your local FISDOs. If you're not able to get a, if there is a, not just not, a, not an availability issue, but a, but a timing issue, communicate that to, to the local FISDO office. We look at our designee staffing every quarter, and we get as much input as we can, but, but the best input is from the field specific input. We had X number of students. Here are the times it took to get them to a designee. That's actionable, as opposed to, you know, a 
uh, a more broad comment about availability. So if you have that data, especially for being in the flight school position, I, I would think that many of you would have that data. Share that with the office uh, if, you, if you would, and then that will provide data for us to look at our local designee staffing. So even though they're available uh, without boundaries, uh, certainly, you know, these are local local issues. It's uh, it's going to be uh, tough to have a, if the designee's in Seattle and you're in Washington, they're in <laughs> Seattle, D.C., Washington, they're not likely to fly out to do that check ride. So, so we understand there are some geographic challenges around that, but the best thing you can do is share that data, share your stories with the local office and ask them to look at that with respect to their local de designee uh, numbers. Uh, there was a recent effort to for additional designations, and that happened nationwide. So I do know there has been some movement in that area, but still takes time to get those designees trained, get them on board, get them out there actually performing check rides. But there are efforts within our current system to do that. And as far as uh, what what uh, what comes uh, down the road, we'll we'll be responsive to those. Thank you. Anybody in the room? We also are working with our members. So if you're a member or not a member, you know, call us. You know, we can maybe help you in this category. Uh, because again, I think you're doing a great job in DC, it sounds like, but n not all 82 or 78 of you, you know, are, are at the same level, and it's just the truth. So thank you for that. what thank you're you. doing. Thank you. Uh, my, I'm the Mary Shu is talking about with the people who jump. I'm, I'm a DPE and I travel around the country. Uh, and as well as serve my, my own district of Oregon. And as a DPE and a former 141 school owner, I support this concept. You know, I would love to see this happen more frequently. My concern, and something that may not be, people may not be well aware of, is as DPEs, we serve at the pleasure of the FAA. And for any reason, at any time, and without explanation, we can be removed. End of sentence. And so because of that, part of the equation is that we are people of integrity, quote unquote, and we're all human beings as well. And over the years, we used to have examining authority. I've been doing this a very long time. And it dropped off and dropped off and dropped off and then disappeared and basically became it's not going to happen anymore. And that seemed to be partly because of the quality. Now, I'm sure Bob, and after meeting Bob, I believe Bob is a, a man of great integrity, he runs a great school. But my concern is because we're short on people who can come and observe and supervise the DPE population currently. How is it going to be more possible to take the people out of the FESDO office to supervise those schools in addition? And also, how is it that we're going to get the data you're talking about in terms of, of information as to how we're doing if these applications, and, and I, I hope I, I'm misunderstanding this, but it, but it sounds like they're not going into IACRA. And it sounds like there won't, until the end, perhaps. So we have no data on discontinuances or unsatisfactory performance, right? Which is pretty important in figuring out if the ACS, ACS is working and if we're training appropriately. And so my question is, is that piece going to be added? And also, all DPEs are under the DMS system, designee management. So everything we do, Every time we do it, every place we do it, every kind of airplane we do it in is in the system. So at any time, I can be observed. And that's part of how the quality control occurs. Will DMS be part of the self-examining, as far as you know? I don't know. Um, I'll be honest. Uh, so that falls into our... Um, Designee oversight scope as far as the, the DMS system, so so, which which we do work with at the local level in, in designee oversight, but because and, and which does touch examining authority in the context of the uh, 
airman certification representative. So, so there is some DMS related um, connection there, perhaps not quite to the level of what the, the, the designated pilot examiners are doing, but, but certainly from a data standpoint, some of that is there. So, so there is some data that we can look at internally to see how the system is performing in terms of those timelines, but, but truly the concern is going to be recognized by you first. So that's where that communication with the local office will help us look at that and consider bringing additional designees into the, into the system to support that need. Because if, if there is a need, it's a relatively simple question to answer. We will add another designee. But right, then there is the management of the, of the designees. That's going to be constrained to our 2,500-ish uh, operations inspectors throughout, throughout the FAA. Um, but then also that comes to what I mentioned about how FISOs manage workload in risk-based decision-making. So part of what we're doing in the designee oversight arena is looking at the risk of the, the nature of the rides that are happening and the data that's in the system and using that to drive where we should be at any given, any given day to make sure that we are in the place that we should be to effectively manage risk in the system, uh, which may mean that you see the inspector more. It may mean you see him less, depending on the nature of your activities as a designee or as an ACR. Thank you. You're and I, I appreciate your effort to make this happen. I, like I said, I support it. I'm just a little concerned about how that's going to happen. Yeah, there, 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 it's definitely a, uh, a lot of moving parts in this arena, and I think at the end we're, we're really trying to get to an outcome that adequately serves the GA community without creating additional risk, and that's where it's a, it's a tricky dance, but I really do think that here in the very near future we're going to uh, take some pretty important steps down that road. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Michael? Sir. Thanks. You, you really laid out a, a very objective um, uh, process by which you become a, a get examining authority, and, and Bob did too. The DPE, the impression I have of the DPE community is, and how the DPE selection process has, and I was just talking to my boss about this the other day, is it looks like an old boy network you know, of how they're picking DPEs. And, and maybe that's just because it's, you know, there's integrity and responsibility, and that's a misimpression, you know? How, how and you don't have to speak of this at length, but is it, how objective is that selection process for DPEs? There are so many factors that are probably quite subjective, so maybe it's just a, an urban legend. So I'll say that, uh... Uh, since we're talking about DMS, the Destiny Management System, it has gotten more objective. So a few years back, before DMS, those decisions were, in essence, made locally. Now the process is, when a need is identified for a designee, the local management, the FISDO manager will make that determination and start the selection process. That process includes uh, two inspectors and somebody from the policy division. So it is not uh, quite the uh, local process that it once was. So we're bringing more people into that process to look at the, f the list of qualified applicants. And there is a uh, more broad review that happens in the final selection for that designee appointment. So, so I think we're moving down toward uh, more objective selection based on looking at the contents of an application and they were, there's less opportunity for bias, whether it's intentional or uh, I believe it unintentional, to, to come into that process. So, so I think that DMS has moved us further down that road to, to make sure that we're appointing the, the best qualified applicant based on the needs of the, of the community. You're welcome. Hey, Michael and uh, uh, Bob, thank you for the uh, the information. Um, my name is Jordan Brzezowski. I'm an active duty Coast Guardman and uh, assistant chief flight instructor at Wings uh, Flight School in Vacaville, Cal California. Um, I had a question about the Airman Certification Representative, um, just some clarification. So the, the ACR is not the individual issuing the final prop check, our state check. Is that correct? Separate entity? 
the, the, the ACR will issue the pilot certificate. They will issue the temporary. The test, I mean the actual test. No, so insofar as their ACR designation, no, they do not perform the final stage check. Okay, so is then the ACR required, um, or is that something that could be an option for us to leave that, that admin burden on the FISDO? <laughs> you could choose to do that, yes. Okay, um, and then a uh, second part to that, could we then uh, contract out that admin burden to a DPE, since a DPE can automatically be an ACR is kind of what it sounded like? Is sure. that something we could contract yeah, and, out and just for the admin And that's side? a, um, yes, asterisk. So they would then need to meet the, meet the requirements of the ACR, so they would need to be part of the school, be superior to the chief instructors. They would have to have a position in your school. Okay. So as opposed to, you mentioned contracting out, uh, there, uh, as an air agency, there's nothing that requires that I am aware of that person to be a direct employee of the school. However, they would need to have an organizational position in the school. So that may, yeah, there's some questions there that I would need to look into further as to what's appropriate. But uh, uh, without uh, specific policy citing one way or the other, it would just come down to the, the elements of the policy. But they would need to have a position of the school, and they would need to be superior to the chief instructors of the courses that examining authority was issued for. So if a school um, doesn't have somebody superior to that chief instructor with the commercial instrument, which is a requirement, uh, would it be feasible to have the chief instructor be that ACR and have the assistant chief instructor issuing the actual test? No, it's it would have no. to be someone different. Okay, thank you. Any A question about just support in general from the FISDO. I mean, we've over the last two years, we've POIs changing, and we've had a couple of periods where we don't have a POI. Like right now, we don't have a POI. Yeah. And so we have all of these requests out there. I mean, what recourse do we have? Conversation with the local FISDO management. Uh, yeah, same we're not, problem. We're not, <laughs> we're not so bad. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So, um, yeah, so that is a situation. Um, many offices are in, um, they don't have any operations inspectors. Um, there are some things that do need inspector involvement, TCO reviews, someone to do the check ride with your, with your chief instructors, assistant chiefs. So we know that there are things that, that, that you need support around. I go back to communication, ask those questions of the FISDO. Who can we reach out to? Can we submit a, uh, an FSERP request? which is our system for reaching out to other offices around the country to come perform those activities. Uh, and you can ask if, if, if that path has been pursued. Yeah, Great. It's, it's a difficult situation in a lot of places and I don't, uh, I don't want it for anybody. Any other questions? Michael. We greatly appreciate you coming out here from uh, from I greatly DC appreciate and addressing the this. So thank you. thank you so much. Now 